In 2018, 80 years after the November pogrom of 1938, I stood in front of an audience in the American city of Pittsburgh to give a Kristallnacht memorial lecture. I had been invited as a result of my work on German memory and the Holocaust. I felt honored to accept the invitation, but also experienced some trepidation what might it mean for me, a grandson of the German generation of perpetrators and enablers, to speak on such an important and meaningful occasion? Two weeks before my lecture, the unthinkable happened. Eleven Jewish worshippers were brutally murdered at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue, close to where I would speak. Nothing I had seen or done up to that point could possibly have prepared me to address members of a community that had just experienced the worst act of anti-Semitic violence in the history of the United States. I had spoken to many audiences about the obligation of German memory in the aftermath of the Holocaust. I had talked about the emotional dynamics within German families that sought to keep the Holocaust at bay. I had explored the limits of Germans, Germany's memory culture and argued for the need to engage a felt sense of history's traumas. Until that point, however, I had always believed, or perhaps naively hoped, that the dark shadows of Germany's Nazi history might remain consigned to the past. After the massacre in Pittsburgh, it became impossible to avoid the upsurge of Nazism in the present. In the year that followed, there were more attacks on Jewish Americans and racial hatred against black, indigenous, and people of, of color became commonplace. In Canada, where I live, incidents of racism increased exponentially. In Germany, the racially motivated riots in Chemnitz and the attack on a synagogue in Halle broke through Germany's culture of remembrance, leading many to wonder what, if anything, had been learned. The threat posed by the extreme right seemed to be everywhere in evidence. It's easy to feel powerless in the presence of such racial hatred. But as I also learned, we cannot stay silent lest we become complicit in the evil we abhor. In view of the social and political crises we face today, the need to address the violence in our midst has rarely been more pressing. We must redouble our efforts to educate about the Holocaust and ab above all address the contemporary reality of anti-Semitism and racism. But what, we wonder, might this process involve? I'm not a specialist in anti-Semitism. Rather, as a historian and as a psychoanalyst, I seek to understand how we are shaped by the traumatic histories we inherit. The stories of our lives are always and already embedded in the history and culture of our families and communities. To paraphrase the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, we are born with a past, and whether we like it or not, whether we recognize it or not, we become the bearers of that history and culture. The question that concerns me is how the violent and traumatic past is intertwined with the hateful present. Indeed, as psychoanalysis reminds us, the effects of violent and traumatic histories don't disappear. They keep showing up, reminding us of their presence. Psychoanalysis has been called a traumatized profession because so many of its early members were directly and indirectly affected by the Holocaust. Our attempts to confront and to understand the perpetration of genocide emerged out of a silence and a silencing of the past. This process of addressing historical trauma 
be it in the psychoanalytic profession or in society as a whole, was only possible with an acknowledgement of how we are shaped by society, culture, and history. The intertwining of self and society was central to the life and work of Erich Fromm. Over the course of his career, Fromm sought to show again and again how we are consciously and unconsciously shaped by social, political, and historical forces. During a time when most clinicians felt that the individual psyche and the analytic setting should be the sole focus of their attention, Fromm was one of very few psychoanalysts to consistently address social and political inequities. At the height of his popularity, Fromm was known as a purveyor of hope, a public intellectual and psychoanalyst whose writings offered humanity a way forward. But underlying this popular image was a more complex reality. A thinker and clinician who kept returning to the threat posed by authoritarianism, racial narcissism, and human destructiveness, ever wary of what humans were capable of. In October 1979, only a few months before he died, Swiss television aired an interview with Fromm. The interviewer asked Fromm whether he thought humanity has changed as a result of the atrocities of the Holocaust. Fromm's answer was as brief as it was disquieting. From a social perspective, I do not see that we have changed so much for the better, that under certain historical circumstances, what happened 40 years ago could not also happen again. It would require that human beings had themselves significantly changed and become more alive, engaged, and courageous. But unfortunately, that is not something we can say. Fromm's bracing statement has been borne out by the genocides that have occurred since the Holocaust and by the level of racial violence we see in the world, us, around, in the world around us today. What is less known is the degree to which Fromm's own life experience shaped his, shaped his approach to the study of human destructiveness. The rise of Nazism forced Fromm to leave his native country. After arriving in the United States in 1934, he witnessed Germany's perpetration of the Holocaust from afar. Many of Fromm's family members, together with friends and colleagues, were murdered. This evening, I'm going to read directly from some of the unpublished Holocaust letters in Fromm's family, and I wish to thank Professor Funk for a permission to do so. The letters allow us to glimpse the trauma experienced by a single German-Jewish family, an unspeakable tragedy that was repeated over and over, seemingly countless times. We're easily overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of victims in the Holocaust, which is why I believe Fromm's family letters are so important. They break through the abstraction and historical distance with which we encounter the catastrophe. They challenge us to explore what it means to be implicated in perpetration of genocide and in systemic racism that shapes our societies today. Though Fromm remained publicly silent about his family tragedy, he responded through his writings, turning again and again to examine the social and cultural forces that gave rise to destructiveness and beseeching us to work towards building a just and a better society. Speaking on a subject of this importance within the short window of time we have this evening inevitably means that my comments will be selective. In the discussion that follows, I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts and elaborations, and I know that there are many specialists among us. Let me begin with some brief biographical facts to remind us about Fromm's remarkable life. <clears throat> Born into a middle-class German-Jewish family in Frankfurt, Fromm completed his doctorate in sociology in the early 1920s before turning to psychoanalysis. 
The intertwining of psyche and society would come to define Fromm's work and caught the attention of Max Horkheimer. In 1930, Horkheimer invited Fromm to join the Frankfurt School, and in the years that followed, Fromm wrote a series of important papers outlining how a group's social character shapes the thinking, feeling, and acting of individuals who belong to that group. Among Fromm's noteworthy works from the early 1930s was his study of the character structure of the German working class. Based on a series of questionnaires, Fromm revealed pro-fascist tendencies amongst workers who were presumed to be solidly against authoritarianism. In 1933, when the Nazi party was elected to power, Fromm could not know with any certainty what the future in Germany would hold, but he clearly knew enough to understand that he should leave. Once Fromm arrived in New York, he sought to establish himself in his new environment and joined with Karen Horney, Harry Stack Sullivan, and others to form what became known as the Cultural School of Psychoanalysis, and what we now call interpersonal psychoanalysis. Fromm's psychoanalytic position of the time can be summed up in the following statement. The fundamental approach to human personality is the understanding of the human being's relationship to the world, to others, to nature, and to him or herself. We believe that the human being is primarily a social being and not, as Freud assumes, primarily self-sufficient and only secondarily in need of others in order to satisfy his or her instinctual needs. In this sense, we believe individual psychology is fundamentally social psychology. In Germany, meanwhile, as Fromm was developing this work, anti-Jewish legislation increased at an alarming rate. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 disenfranchised German, uh, Jewish Germans and prohibited them from participating in society and government. More laws and persecution followed, culminating in the November pogrom which resulted in the widespread destruction of synagogues, businesses, and homes throughout Germany and Austria. The first mass deportation of Jewish men to concentration camps in the days that followed presaged the wholesale deportation and murder of German and Austrian Jewish communities between 1941 and 1943. Living in New York and watching the events fold, unfold from afar, Fromm was acutely aware of the threats posed by Nazi Germany, both to a democratic way of life and to the lives of his family, friends, and colleagues who still lived there. Yet Fromm's personal experience of the time remained firmly in the background, unspoken and rarely articulated. Instead, he responded through his writings developing the ideas that led to the publication of Escape from Freedom in 1941. Fromm was one of the only European Jewish psychoanalysts to publicly write about the rise of Nazism while events were still unfolding. Given the ascendancy of anti-Semitism in the United States at the time, this was not without risk. Escape from Freedom proceeds by way of historical narrative and its timely and accessible nature explains its enormous popularity. I don't have space to go into detail, but in brief, the question that occupied Fromm was why so many of his fellow Germans were willing to follow Hitler and the Nazi regime. Fromm believed that Hitler provided millions of Germans with a means to escape from the uncertainty by submitting to a totalitarian authority. The emotional appeal of Nazi ideology lay in its spirit of blind obedience to a leader and of hatred against racial and political minorities, its craving for conquest and domination, its exaltation of the German people and the Nordic race." End quote. Fromm's account of the appeal of authoritarianism, especially in times of economic and social uncertainty, has taken on new meaning in light of the current political trends.
And indeed, there has been a renewed interest in the arguments from put forth in Escape from Freedom as we face contemporary growth of fascist politics in many nations. After arriving in the United States and throughout the decade to follow, Fromm was consumed with finding ways to rescue those left behind. Fromm was an only child. His father died of a heart attack in late 1933, having witnessed Hitler's rise to power. His mother chose to remain behind along with her siblings, believing, or at least hoping, that the ascent of the Nazis was a momentary madness. After the November pogrom, escaping Germany became extremely difficult. In order to, for Fromm's mother to leave, Fromm had to secure a large monetary loan to pay the Nazi regime. Rosa spent the next 18 months in England, and before she could join her son in New York, Fromm was required to pay another hefty fee, this time to the US authorities, whose policy for admitting Jewish refugees was harshly selective. In fact, as legal scholars have recently shown, the political and racial structure of America at the time, in the form of Jim Crow laws and immigration laws, provided the Nazi regime with an early model for how to enact its own racial laws, though certainly no one needed to teach Hitler or his followers how to hate. Rosa was finally able to join her son in New York in 1941 but a different fate awaited her siblings. Rosa had grown up in Berlin and most of her family still lived there. Her sister, Sophie Englander, and husband were deported from Berlin to Theresienstadt. Her brother, Martin Krause, and his wife were deported to the Warsaw Ghetto and then to Auschwitz. Her beloved cousin, Gertrud Brandt, together with her husband and youngest son, were sent to a ghetto in eastern Poland and then to Treblinka. None survived. Fromm's cousins and second cousins, who were unable to flee in time, were pursued and persecuted. Some were killed, others committed suicide. Fromm participated in a voluminous family correspondence from the time he emigrated until the end of the Second World War. Letters were exchanged among multiple family members. Each tried to keep the others abreast of developments in a constant search to save those left behind. Fromm came to play a central role in this process and helped his family members in whatever way he could, often sending money. But the draconian immigration policies and the prohibitive cost of exit visas severely limited what he was able to do. Some of Fromm's family correspondence have sur has survived, and I will quote from the letters of Sophie Englander and Gertrude Brandt, both of whom were an important presence in Fromm's early life. Their letters illustrate the unfolding tragedy that beset a single German-Jewish family over the course of the Holocaust. Some of the letters demonstrate the depth of the need and suffering that was endured. Others convey the strength of spirit, love of life, and unbreakable bonds between family members. It's hard to read the letters knowing of the tragedy that awaits the writers and the sadness that would confront family members who survived. I will provide some brief commentary, but will keep my, com my, my discussion to a minimum in order to allow Sophie and Gertrude's words to speak for themselves. Sophie Englander's letters were written from Berlin over a three and a half year period, from March 1939 until September 1942, when she and her husband were deported to Treblinka. They were addressed to her younger daughter, Eva, who left for La Paz, Bolivia, with her husband and their two young children in the spring of 1939. The letters document the ever worsening situation of Berlin's Jewish community. Families were forced out of their homes and into shared accommodations. Children were forced out of regular schools and into overcrowded, segregated schools. What seemed unimaginable just a few years earlier was now a cruel and inescapable reality. Beginning in the autumn of 1941, members of Berlin's Jewish community were arrested and deported to concentration camps and ghettos. 
March 10th, 1939. This morning, your letter from Straßland arrived and gave us great joy. The children appear to have been exemplary, hopefully the border crossing with the ferry and the onward trip to, St to Stockholm will be just as uneventful. Because I wrote down all the dates, I was able to follow you in my thoughts and knew that you are there now. August 11th. Hopefully we can really experience the next birthday with you. I can't even put into words how nice that would be. It would be important to know how much foreign exchange is necessary. Unfortunately, it will be much more than you need it because we probably need flagship money and half of the ship's tickets must be paid for in foreign currency. Maybe Erich can contribute something and perhaps with support from an aid society. But just imagine what sums would be necessary to pay for this. I can't imagine what we can, that we can get the necessary funds. October 8th. Tante Rosenchen has arrived in London. That's Erich's mother. What a shame it is that she isn't already with Erich, and we are unable to get any news from her directly. November 10th. Because no dispatches can be sent from here without special permission, we will write an email letter to Erich today with a request that he telegraph you that we are all well. January 11th. In regard to the visa, it seems to be quite hopeless. As I already wrote in the previous letter, don't worry about us in this regard. As long as the war continues, it would have been so difficult anyway that it hardly seems as though it could have been possible. March 1940. Just imagine, a few days ago, I received a letter from Erich that was un underway for over four months. He wrote about Tante Rosentchen's well-being and he will be writing to you very soon, November 3rd. Today, Trude, Gertrud Brandt, whose letters I will discuss in a moment, wrote that Erich tra transferred money to her. The bank there needs to confirm with Erich's bank, so it can still take some time. It will, of course, be a great help for Trudi. Write to Erich for us with warmest wishes, and don't forget to tell him that his letter was underway for four and a half months. June 1941. Today we found out that Heinz, Gertrude Brandt's son, situation is really hopeless and every effort was in vain. You can tell Tante Rosenhien in case my letter shouldn't reach her. It has all come to naught. Erich has been really wonderful and spared no money or effort. Trude's face, faith, sorry, fate is really awful. August 29th, 1942. We're so happy that you are successful and that you are there. How much harder it would be if it was different, although we're so anxious about you. For your birthday, dear Wilhelm, Wilhelm Breslauer was the husband of her daughter, Anna Ruth. We were at your parents and drank coffee to your health. A couple of days later, the parents traveled to Theresienstadt near Prague. We will probably go there in the next while, but do not know the exact date yet. We're glad that we will be able to see each other there again. Father Breslauer's friend, Dr. Alexander, is there too. Likewise, Aunt Flora and countless other friends and acquaintances. Aunt Hulda leaves her apartment the day after tomorrow. It's supposed to be good for us old people there, especially with the climate and surroundings. Regrettably, regrettably, Martin and Johanna are not there. We haven't heard from them in weeks, and I'm terribly worried as Uncle Martin was still weakened by his bile disease. Just stay healthy and don't worry about us. I always repeat it in every letter because I do not know which one will reach you. We've had many good and beautiful things in life, wonderful children and grandchildren, in whom we have the greatest joy. That is worth so much. When you're old, you really know what that means. Send our dearest greetings to Tante Rosentchen and to Erich. September 1st, 1942. Tomorrow we won't be in our apartment any longer. We're going to Theresienstadt to join the Breslauers and Flora and countless acquaintances. 
We still have so much to do that I can't possibly respond to your letter in any detail. We're glad that you are well and that the children are happy and such good students. The parents, Preslauer, will be happy when we share this news with them. We wish with all our heart that you may remain healthy. Maybe there will be a reunion. I greet and kiss you a thousand times and remain in love, your Omi and Opa. Before the Nazis rise to power, Berlin's Jewish community numbered 160,000. By the autumn of 1942, most of Berlin's remaining Jewish citizens, including the Englanders, their friends and relatives, had been deported. On June 16, 1943, the Nazi regime declared that Berlin was officially Judenfrei. Gertrud Brandt's letters are fewer in number and date from Januar 19, 1941 to the end of February 1943. Gertrud was an important presence in Fromm's life and son, Heinz. I'm sorry, uh, in Fromm's life and, um, life and her son, Heinz, who survived the Holocaust, remained Fromm's lifelong friend and confidant. Gertrud's letters were addressed to a close friend with whom she was able to carry out a correspondence. In December 1939, after the Nazi invasion of Poland, Gertrud, her husband, and her younger son were sent to the ghetto of Ostrov Lubelski, near Lublin. The letters were all written during her captivity there. The Brandts were German-speaking Jews who lived in the city of Posen, which had been the capital of the Eastern Prussian province until 1919. When the Germans invaded Poland, they, were de they deported the entire Jewish community of Posen to a series of ghettos. Before the war, Gertrud had been a teacher and a social worker, and in the ghetto, she became a caregiver for children. Her letters are deeply moving. Her reflections on the nature of human relating and love and the fundamental importance of giving freely of oneself to others are often profound. She is a gifted writer, and her letters are written in a beautiful, lyrical style. I've selected a number of passages to convey their overall content, but I fear my translations don't do justice to the original. January 1941. If you can get used to not expecting anything for yourself in life, really nothing, then you free yourself at the same time from dissatisfactions in the present, as well as from a fear of the future. One can learn to experience life as a gift so that it excludes any demand. You're happy, poor. You encounter the difficulties serenely, and you make every effort to help your fellow human being. April 1941. Throughout her imprisonment, Gertrude's thoughts shift between the needs of those she cares for in the ghetto and the needs of her far-flung children. My eldest, Heinz, of whom I wrote, is in the Oranienburg concentration camp. There isn't any way I can actually help him because one can't send any money from here. In any case, it simply isn't possible because I don't have anything and can only just keep my head above water. I used to get a contribution from a relative in New York, Erich which unfortunately has not arrived the past two months. So we are both surviving only from care packages and the sale of our possessions. As time passes, Gertrude's letters reflect her struggle to hold onto a sense of humanity. July, 1941. As important as it has become for me that you have included me in your circle of care, what really lifts me up and supports me is the fact itself that a person draws from her own deep source and joyfully gives it to others to experience. It is this power of goodness alone that I so admire. I have no admiration for cleverness, education, ability, if goodness is not there first, if goodness is not completely determinative at the center of being and everything radiates out from it. How is it possible that even with all this so-called intelligence, 
civilization has not brought people even one jot further. I believe deeply in the strength of goodness and love and its eternal and immortal power. It sustains me when I think about it, that maybe my days will not be entirely pointless if only a little bit can radiate out from me to others, maybe to some child or a young woman, maybe to a young person who is engaging life and can carry forward the spark. September 1941. I'm struck with certainty that I want to pass on this love that I receive so that this goodness can become effective as a living force. It calms me and reduces the shame that I feel. In October 1941, a series of mass executions of ghetto prisoners took place. Somehow, we don't know how, Gertrude survived. She continued to live in Ostrov Lubezki for another year and a half. Her final letters reflect the challenge of survival amidst utterly inhumane conditions. February 1943. The pain must not solidify and harden. I've already gone through many gates of suffering. They did not lead me into darkness. Like a blind person when all the senses sharpen, my soul lights torches so I don't lose my way as my life darkens. It is as though all my energy is taken away and consumed, as if the essential living force alone sustains the torches. And this need feeds new energy that is life-sustaining. So I experience the life-sustaining warmth the living proximity of other people like a blood transfusion in the midst of excessive blood loss. It cannot be compared, not a single word. It is the innermost truth. Do you feel what you have given me, how you help me with the care that benefits me and sustains me? It would be best for me now to be intensely active and to help as well as I can. Unfortunately, it won't be possible. The misery prevents me from confronting the need. There are hardly any who can help or who, be, who are capable of helping, only those who are in need of help. How this weighs on me. The thought of finding a way through is tormenting. People say it is not possible and the conditions seem to confirm it, but I want to find a way regardless. If it is not possible, then the impossible needs to be attempted because people are perishing of weakness. They are being lost. Fathers mourned by their families, mothers mourned by their children. And I can only modestly give of my own and share to the outermost limit. I can only really help very few. I cannot slow the giant wheel of fate. Ever since the packages have stopped arriving, the need is without end. And finally, April 22nd, 1943. Every fear of change has fallen away from me. I have lived a full and a rich life, and it no longer matters to me whether it now ends with a long turnaround or is cut short. As long as I can be useful, I want to do it. And who can say to me that under different circumstances, I can't do this just as well or even better This was Gertrude's last known communication, written on a postcard in which she states that she has to leave the ghetto to make room for new arrivals. She was sent to Treblinka and killed a short time later. The emotional impact of hearing Sophie and Gertrude's words has not lessened with time. The horrors of the Holocaust still challenge our comprehension, 80 years on. Each time I read their letters, I find it difficult to continue with any sort of discussion. Their words speak to the immensity of the pain and suffering to which they and millions more were subjected. I spent many hours studying and translating their letters. I felt privileged to do so. The women I came to know were highly intelligent, incredibly strong, 
and immensely caring. I grieve their deaths. Being witness to their lived experience and knowing of the horrors they endured, even if only from afar, breaks through the distance of history. We're confounded by the numbers of the Holocaust victims, six million Jewish European murdered, six million Jewish Europeans murdered, of which over one million were children. But when we focus on the numbers alone, we risk losing sight of individual persons. The life of each victim was as real as our own in this room this evening. Knowing their stories has become ever more important, especially as the last survivors leave us. How we talk about the Holocaust informs how we respond to the catastrophe and shapes what future generations will know and remember. There is also a different side to this process. One that can be more difficult to talk about and engage with because it is personal. What does it mean for me, a third generation German, to share these letters with you? How might my family history implicate me in the very crimes that led to the murders of Sophie, Gertrude, and their loved ones? These are not easy questions to answer, but we are surely obliged to ask. How do we contend with legacies of perpetration we have inherited by way of family and community, of terrible crimes that occurred before we were born, or in which we may have had no direct involvement? Do those of us with German family histories know what our own family members believed, said, or did during this time? Finding words for that which has remained unspoken can be difficult. Talk of the Nazi past and the Holocaust in German families often evokes a sense of guilt and shame. It can elicit defensive postures, even outright denial. Amongst my general, generational peers, I encounter an ever-increasing weariness with Germany's memory culture <clears throat> and a wish to avoid any association with its dark history. It's so long ago. Why ask questions now? I know it happened. Isn't that enough? I'm tired of feeling guilty. Why should I feel bad? I had nothing to do with it. Regardless of who we are or where we live, we're familiar with these kinds of statements. They are just as recognizable to me from my life in Canada as I assume they are to you from your lives in Germany. Many Canadians seek to deny or look away when asked to address the indigenous genocide on which their country was built. We simply don't want to be burdened by a criminal past that is not of our own making. But that criminal past also shapes our present. Systemic discrimination against Indigenous people in Canada is just as real as the upsurge of anti-Semitism and right-wing extremism in present-day Germany. The pervasive threat of racism cannot be denied. As I said at the beginning of my talk, and as Fromm shows us over and over, we simply cannot escape our history. What will we find if we turn towards that history rather than away from it? Let me draw on my own German family to illustrate. I learned about the Holocaust from my parents at a young age. They were born in Hanover in 1935 and joined a large wave of young Germans who immigrated in the decades after the war. I grew up with two cultures and two languages, made more real by frequent trips to Germany and later years living in Switzerland. When I was a child, my parents shared with me the horrors committed by Nazi Germany and taught me about the obligation to remember. But as so often happened in German families, just as one door to the past was opened, another remained closed. Talk of war in my family was of schreckliche Zeiten, of the terrible times and the suffering endured. 
It was not about responsibility. I knew of the destruction, loss, and death that my family members lived through, of houses destroyed by bombs, of nights in bomb shelters, of fear and of hunger, of fallen fathers, uncles, and brothers, of the long imprisoned. There seemed to be a tacit agreement among three generations of my family to maintain these familiar narratives while keeping other histories at bay. I have no comparative memory of ever talking about what my grandparents actually did or believed in relation to the Nazi regime. My family history, like many others, remained shrouded in shades of gray. Oops. Oh, okay. My family history, like so many others, remained shrouded in shades of gray, never distinct enough to make out more than a ghostly contour of what might be lurking, waiting to be called out and known. It was only late in life, as if by chance and circumstance, that I spied an unfamiliar photograph of my young grandfather in uniform, the man I had known and loved as a child. I struggled to make room for a history at odds with the fond memories of the time we spent during my regular childhood visits. I did not know that my grandfather applied to the Nazi party in 1936. Oops, sorry. Okay, a little difficulty with the slides. I did not know that my grandfather applied to the Nazi party in 1936, was inducted a year later, and participated in the NSKK, the so-called car club used by the Nazi regime to indoctrinate middle-class Germans. In recent years, historians have demonstrated that the NSKK members attended lectures on racial ideology, participated in the November pogrom, and provided support for mass exterminations in Eastern Europe. There is no ambiguity in this history, no shades of gray. Reckoning with the Nazi past in our own families breaks through the filters we create, but the ramifications can be difficult. After glimpsing the photograph of my grandfather, I confronted my mother. Our dialogue began in fits and starts. It turned out we had both been afraid to find words for what had remained unsaid. Soon my mother started to share memories that felt at times like an emotional torrent, long ago experiences that were waiting to be heard. But while my mother was willing to address the Nazi past in our family, there are others who feel that I have done my grandfather an injustice. They no longer welcome me. I share this story with you because it illustrates. I share this story with you because it illustrates the degree to which emotional conflicts shape legacies of perpetration. To be sure, there are a host of reasons why someone became a Nazi. Not every Nazi was a murderer, just as there were anti-Semites who did not join the Nazi party. But what is clear is that the system of perpetration could only function because millions of people enabled the Nazi regime. Everyday people, like my own grandparents, who joined up or willingly looked away, at least as long as it worked in their favor. It is the act of enabling which poses as grave a threat to our society as it did so many decades ago. The reality of anti-Semitism, the kinds of prejudice that gave rise to the terrors of the Third Reich cannot be denied. There are many German descendants whose family, mirrors, whose family histories mirror my own. Histories of a Nazi past that were never openly discussed, or have been disavowed. Even as Germany stands out for its collective memory culture, many family histories still wait to be reckoned with. For me, a recognition of a Nazi past in my family lends the Holocaust a terrible and chilling reality that I cannot ignore. 
it forces me to reflect on the emotional meaning of what occurred and reinforces my obligation to remember and to speak out. A willed and willful amnesia must not be allowed to take the place of informed understanding. But dissociation and denial remain powerful forces, even when we are confronted with the hatred and the violence that surrounds us. Fromm understood this and knew what it meant to take a stand. He felt compelled to speak out against forces of destruction and hatred. After the Holocaust, the genocide that consumed the lives of many of Fromm's family members remained simultaneously present and absent in his work. I believe that many of Fromm's books can be read as a response to the tragedy and despair he witnessed. His emphasis on the need to build a just and fair post-war society sought to reassure, sought to assure the survival of social democracy in the face of political threats. At the height of the civil rights movement in the United States, Frum spoke directly to the insidious nature of racism and the need to address its source. In the heart of man, Frum introduced the notion of racial narcissism to explain the terror inflicted by the white majority on African Americans. He drew direct parallels to the subjugation of Jewish Germans in Nazi Germany and asked, in effect, what might we learn from these tragedies so they will not be repeated? Nor was the political situation in post-war Germany ever far from Fromm's mind. In May Man Prevail, Fromm expressed his concern about whether the new West German nation would ever truly address its dark past. Fromm warned that many former Nazis populated the highest echelons of government. His observations were correct, and we know today that it was only in the 1970s that West Germany began more fully to address its collective responsibility. Nor is it fortuitous that one of Fromm's last and perhaps most far-reaching books, The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, includes a lengthy analysis of malignant aggression and an examination of the character structures of Himmler and Hitler. In the face of the horrors of the Holocaust and the tragedy endured by his own family, it would have been easy for Fromm to ascribe to the popular belief in an innate aggressive drive. But Frum rejects the notion of internal drives and instead argues that we must work to identify the social and cultural conditions that enable destructiveness and hatred to flourish. When it came to the possibility for change, Frum retained a clear-eyed realism. In 1979, he was asked by the same Swiss television journalist about whether people had actually learned anything from the Holocaust. Fromm's response was telling, quote, here we confront the question of whether humans actually learn anything on their own. Do they even want to learn? Or do they remain tied to their entrenched opinions and insights? I believe the readiness to learn is much more limited than we assume. Our lives are structured in such a way that people are first of all oriented towards functioning, but not towards thinking. Fromm believed that it was only by addressing how we function in society that we might begin to move towards a more open-minded position based on rational thought and action. He was encouraging us to engage with others, to build a more just world in essence, to learn and to love life. This outlook points us back in the direction of Fromm's own lived experience and to his work as a practicing psychoanalyst. Fromm's therapeutic approach tends to be little known because unlike other well-known psychoanalysts, Fromm did not write extensively about therapeutic technique. What we find when we look more closely, however, is enlightening. For Fromm, 
Healing takes place through a kind of empathic dialogue, an interaction that orients us towards the other person, not as an object, but in his or her being. As he states, the analyst must be endowed with a capacity for empathy with another person and strong enough to feel the experience of the other as if it were his own. The condition for such empathy is an optimal of the capacity for love. To understand another means to love him or her, not in the erotic sense, but in the sense of reaching out to him or her and of overcoming the fear of losing oneself. Understanding and loving are inseparable. Looking back, what is remarkable in my view is how much Fromm's perspective on empathy and love has in common with the outlook Gertrude Brandt expressed in her own letters from the ghetto, particularly when she writes, I believe deeply in the strength of goodness and love and it's in its eternal and immortal power it sustains me when I think about it that maybe my days will not be entirely pointless if only a little bit of goodness and love can radiate out from me to others. Gertrude's words are themselves echoed by Fromm in his 1956 book, The Art of Loving, where he proclaims, quote, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Despite their different circumstances, Gertrude and Erich both sought to find meaning and possibilities for human relating, suggesting in effect that it is the potential for empathy and love that forms a countervailing force to human destructiveness and hate. With the benefit of hindsight, I think we can see Fromm's faith in living and his emphasis on achieving a fullness of relational life as a critical response to the racial violence and genocide of his lifetime. As we confront the political and social turmoil that engulfs our own age, Fromm leaves us with both a warning and a sense of hope. We must not sit back. The threat is real. We need to do more only by recognizing and moving towards human interconnection can we actually learn from one another. Throughout his life, Fromm held fast to our potential for learning and loving. That gives me hope. Perhaps in some small way, my talk this evening can contribute to our shared learning process. Thank you.